you to be in service one more time. And we just appreciate God and all of his goodness, and his faithfulness uh, to all generations, and especially our generation. Amen. And Merry Christmas to everyone. And uh, truly, Jesus is the reason for the season. Uh, some people, they call him CEOs, not uh, chief executive officer, but Christmas and Easter only. Uh, people that attend church just twice a year. So uh, if you didn't make it this Sunday, hopefully you'll make it next Sunday. And uh, we'll look forward to being in service together. Amen. If the Lord wills. Amen. Just now let's stand before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this yes, time. Jesus, yes. We pray, God, that you bless each one, Lord, that you would, God, provide, Lord, all what we have need of today, Lord, that you would unction us fresh by your spirit, Lord. Touch our hearts, touch our lives. God, help us to enter in to receive from you, Lord, all of your abundant gifts, Lord, that you have for us, God. And help us, Lord, to reach in, God, by faith, Lord, to draw out from you, God, that living water today. And Lord, we'll be careful to give you all the praise Amen. and all the glory and all the honor today in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's turn uh, in our hymnals, page 80. Sing us on joy to the world. <clears throat> Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive the King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let man the songs employ while fields and floods, like fields and flames, repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more attempt and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found, far as, far as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace, and makes the nations true. The glories of his righteousness. And wonders of his love, and wonders of his love, and wonders, wonders, wonders. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive a king. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing. And in heaven, nature three, no more sin and sorrow, no thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found, far as, far as the curse is found. Lord, you are right now. Thank you, God. Bless and meet every need today, God. We love you. Praise your holy name, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's change the order to sing one of our more traditional songs. All right. How about glory to his name? Glory to his name. <clears throat> Amen. Mm -hmm. Dance. 
church calendar type of thing. Somebody just uh, pulled out their magic wand and they just anointed December 25th to be this day to celebrate the, the birth of Jesus. But that being said, we can't reinvent the wheel, right? We can't reinvent Christmas. 
So we'll celebrate it because we know that Jesus did come. Amen. He was born, whether it was in December or January or other months in the year, yeah. right? Would be it whatever it may be, right? We know that he was born, Amen. right? And, and this birth um, was, you know, the, the culmination of so much work on behalf of God and the fulfillment of so many prophecies God had given to us. At some point, you have to take a drink or, or put it down. <laughs> right. It's just water. It's just water. Uh, but uh, but God, God made a promise that he would send this seed born of a woman, born under the law. And the Bible tells us, I believe, in the book of Galatians, in the fullness of time, God sent his son Jesus. And that he came to earth to be the savior of mankind. And God sent the message to both Mary and to Joseph, uh, among others, and saying that he shall be called, he shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Also, he's known as Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. And it's just amazing that God who made the heavens and the earth, God that rules heaven and everything in the heaven, everything under the heaven, that he decided one day to send his son and his son decided to lay aside his glory in heaven and to be born as a human being in the womb of a virgin and, and laid to rest there in a manger in Bethlehem. And a manger was basically a feeding trough for animals. There was no room for them in the inn, but I want you to know it may, they may have had a, they had a kind of a poor beginning uh, you know, to where the, how the world sees things in, in the eyes of God, it was glorious, and the angels were there appearing to the shepherds that were watching their flocks by night. And they, they saw these angels singing and celebrating uh, the coming of Jesus to the earth after he was born. And those shepherds went to go find where Jesus and, and uh, his, his parents were, his mother was, and they worshiped. They're in that stable with animals. They're with these shepherds that were, you know, these, these guys living outside, basically. And, and they're, you know, in, in the midst of all this, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, it, did, it didn't look that good, right? It, didn't, it wasn't the finest hotel. It wasn't the best accommodations. And it wasn't the best among uh, human beings to be present there. But in the eyes of God, it was perfect. Right? And so when you think about uh, how you're unworthy, how we're all unworthy, just remember Jesus humbled himself to be born that way. And because he was born, he later died for us and paid the price for our sin. And that's, that's the, the greater story. The greater story of the gospel is Jesus paid for the sins of us all in his own blood. Uh, but if he had not been born, he could not later die for us and pay the price for us on the cross. So thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. So that's prayer with us. Amen. Amen. Pastor was sharing something this morning about Emmanuel, God with us. You know, God made a commitment to us. That's, that's one thing about God. He made a commitment to us. He said that while we were yet sinners, God loved us. He set his affections on us while we were yet sinners. And I say that from a person that there was a time in my need when I needed God. I needed something. I didn't know where to go. I had done this. I had tried that church. I had done all this stuff. But I hadn't come to a place of surrender in my heart. And I finally got to a place, and I meant business with God. When I told God, I said, God, look, I'm going to give you my life. But this is what I'm going to do. I said, God, I'm going to give you my life, and I'm going all in. But if you don't do it and step up and do something to my life, I'm going to live like there's no God. I'm going to basically become an atheist. Because it's, that's just the way it is. I wanted to be 100% real with God. But see, God stepped up. That night, I went up there in my, my barracks when I was in the military. And uh, I was tired. I was, I was tired because I had prayed for God to do something in my life a lot of times. But I hadn't, I hadn't surrendered. I went up there and I said, God, I said, if you don't change me, I'm going to get up the same way that I've done so many different times. God, if you don't do something in my life, nothing's ever going to change. 
And I got up from that place because God met me. When I got busy and I meant what I said with God, God meant what he said with me. And he stepped up. God's just waiting on us to be real with him. And the next day I went down there and one of the brethren came up. Because in that prayer I said, God, take me. Deal with me and take me to a church where you're doing something. Where your spirit is moving. God, and, and stir me and challenge me. And God did. And the, and the next day a brother came up to me and said, um, he invited me out to church. And right away inside I stepped back a little bit. But God said, did you mean what you said? Did you mean what you said last night? I said, God, there's no time to play games with God. There's no time. He did everything he could when he came on the cross. He laid it down. He says, there comes a time where there's no more playing games with God. And I said, God, that was it. Because I made that choice and I went to church, God filled me up with the Holy Ghost. He gave me a new family, brothers and sisters that really loved me. That I, I even had no idea what real love was about. We have our natural family and we love them. But there is something when you have a family that's a family of God, you begin to open up your heart to them. You don't have to worry about them stabbing you in the back or finding fault with you or, or stuff like that. But you got brothers and sisters that are going to pray for you, that are in your corner, that want the best for you, that reach out to God and say a prayer for you. They've been there. Maybe we've come different ways, but we both walk the same road when we get to the cross. We both need God to move in our heart. We both need the Spirit of God to stir us, and we both need to get on fire for God. And God just sees an open, an open area out there, and he says, lift up your eyes and go out and do something. Go out and reach somebody. Tell somebody that Emmanuel is with us. Amen. There is a difference, and I am so thankful that God got serious with me today, one day, and I'm so thankful that, it, that God brought me to a place to where I got serious with him. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. God is good all the time. All right, take it. This time we'll receive the Sunday tithe and offering. Watching online, there's a link on that uh, page. Just click on it and you give as the Lord has blessed you. God will bless you according as you give. Father, thank you for this opportunity to give back to your program and all that you've blessed us with. God, we ask you to bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Someone say, say it, don't spray it. <laughs> Hold on a second, let me just <laughs> be right back with you guys. Okay. <laughs> it's okay, we can have some fun here. It's not a funeral, it's a celebration. And we know, you know, not ever, not anyone else here ever harasses anybody. So you know, let's just keep it real, okay? Well, I don't think that's very appropriate. Duly noted. All right, duly noted. Um, I'm still for next week. So, anyone that would like to um, join and celebrate along with. Sure, we say right. Jonas and Marissa <laughs> will be uh, joining together in holy matrimony next Sunday after church. Amen. Amen. So, if you don't want to miss any part of it, obviously we want to be here for the 1 30 service and then uh, we'll conduct the, uh, the marriage ceremony right after the regular service next Sunday. So, next day the 20th, so that'd be the 27th. Praise God. They already have the marriage license. And uh, he's got some shiny shoes outside. Outstanding. For him and and uh, it's going to be awesome. Right, so if you'd like to come and join 
in that celebration. That'll be next Sunday. Yes, sir. All right. And then also a fellowship meeting. We'll have details coming out hopefully by tomorrow. Uh, I'll send it out as soon as I have the information and that uh, it's scheduled for January 9th, Saturday, January 9th in Bakersfield. Uh, sure, at an undisclosed location, secure location. <laughs> but I'll give it to you, right? So we don't, we don't want to share it with the whole world because uh, not everybody may be in favor of us having church. Amen. Amen. But that's okay. The devil's been fighting the church for a long time. Yes, sir. But he's still never going to win. And I've already read what the Bible says about it. He's, he's ultimately going down. It's going to be a battle of Armageddon. And it's not a battle of uh, uh, some type of sickness. It's not some kind of plague. It's a literal battle. Jesus coming to earth with all the saints with him. And then the devil will be bound for a thousand years in the bottomless pit, bound with a chain. It's in Revelation chapter 20. And then after that, he'll be loosed for a short season. There'll be a second and final battle called the Battle of Gog and Magog. And after that, the devil will be cast into the lake of fire. And there'll be no more devil causing any more problems in the world. There'll be no more sin in the world. There would be an eternal reign of Jesus Christ. So, you know, people can say whatever they want to say today, and they can complain anything they want to complain about. But ultimately, God is going to have the final say. God is going to have the last word. Mm. So an intelligent person will look ahead and see what the future looks like and start making preparations today, right? Because you know, if you know that's how it's gonna all play out in the end, why would we want to not participate, be what God wants us to be in our life today? Be a blessing to others, right? This time we'll uh, pray. Father, thank you for the service, God. Thank you for your spirit in the service, Lord. We ask you to make preaching easy for pastor. Accomplish your will. Again, God, help us to open up your heart and receive all that you have for us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Reading out of uh, Isaiah chapter 30. So this is a New Testament Christian church. You're not supposed to be in the Old Testament. <laughs> it's a full gospel Christian church. Amen. So what kind of church is this? Well, let, let me tell you. It's a good church. This is a good kind of church. Yeah. Amen. So well, how would you define it? Well, we're undenominational. Uh, some people say non-denominational, but that's not really accurate. Uh, we're fundamental Christian. Fundamental means everything that is basic Bible Christianity. That's what we believe. We're Trin Trinitarians. So, well, I just turned you off because I'm apostolic. I'm one... Well, the Bible is very clear that God is three distinct persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're not a blob. Uh, they're not a triclops, you know, with, you know, three heads, like the Hydra dragon or something. Right. The griffin, you know, with the, the, the body of a lion and the wings of an eagle and a bunch of heads going on. He's not that. Right? He's three distinct persons in the Godhead. And they all work together towards the, the, the betterment of man the salvation of mankind. The Father sent the Son. The Son gave his life. He, he rose again from the dead. And the Son sent the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is here with us today. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we don't want to get, get anything twisted. Right? We, we use the King James Bible. We're full gospel. That means we believe everything from the first end in the beginning all the way to the last. Amen. Revelation chapter 22, I believe. Uh, and there's sound doctrine here. So what, how do you know what a sound doctrine is? The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And you can say, well, I can Google anything. I can look up anything. I can see the Bible for myself. Yes, but without the Holy Spirit guide, and without a God-called minister to teach us the way that God set up the, his church. This is God's church, not my church. I mean, it's my church and I'm part of it, but 
It's not mine as far as ownership. This is the church of Jesus Christ. Um, but to rightly divide, it takes a spirit understand, spiritual understanding. And for good doctrine, you have to have more than one scripture that talks about the same thing. Right? It's the same that applies to the law of witnesses. He said, out of the mouth of two or more witnesses, let every word be established. Just like in a court of law, one witness may not be enough to persuade a jury, but you have two or more witnesses. Well, you know, they all say in the same thing. They saw the same thing, heard the same thing, whatever. So it is with the scripture. You have to have two or more verses of scripture that is talking about the same thing before you can say the Bible teaches this or that or the other. Excuse me. If there's only one verse that speaks on it, you can't use that to teach a doctrine, period. It doesn't matter how good it sounds to you or to your, your family or grandmother, whoever. It doesn't matter where you heard it from. If there's only one verse to support it, that's not a good Bible doctrine. So our church, good, sound doctrine, and uh, we won't lead you astray by the grace of God. All right. Amen. We have Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21. And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it, when ye turn to the right hand, and when ye turn to the left. And I'd like to preach on a title today, The Path Less Traveled. The Path Less Traveled. Um, the first path we want to look at today is the prayer path. And this is... Uh, story I heard many years ago, and I was able to find it online. It's uh, from Our Daily Bread. It's a publication. Uh, most people have probably seen it. Our Daily Bread from November 18th, 1996. It says, in one region of Africa, the first converts to Christianity were very diligent about praying. In fact, the believers each had their own special place outside the village where they went to pray in solitude. The villagers reached these prayer rooms by using their own private footpaths through the brush. When grass began to grow over one of these trails, it was evident that the person to whom it belonged was not praying very much. Because these new Christians were concerned for each other's spiritual welfare, a unique custom sprang up Whenever anyone noticed an overgrown prayer path, he or she would go to the person and lovingly warn, friend, there's grass on your path. And it's just, it's a perfect illustration. I mean, that is just spot on, right? As the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, pray without ceasing. This path of prayer is... The path, one path that's less traveled because uh, there's a lot more people that will talk about Christianity and more people that will talk about God than will actually talk to Jesus and will actually talk to God the Father and actually pray. And that's where our salvation comes from is that prayer of faith, right? He said the prayer of faith shall save the sick if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart. God has raised it from the dead, then we shall be saved. That prayer of faith reaching out to God, that's what brings salvation. He responds to the faith we have in believing him. When we reach out to him, God reaches down. Right? The, the arms of God are long. And he can reach down to the guttermost, right? People say from the uttermost to the guttermost. Jesus saves. And all we have to do is believe enough to look up. And when you look up, you start reaching up. And when you reach up to God as high as you can, that's when God will reach down and bridge the gap. Mm -hmm. God will make up the difference. But if we never reach up, guess what? The connection is not possible. The connection can't happen. God can only reach to those that are reaching out to him. And in Luke chapter 22, verses 39 through 41, it's talking about Jesus. It says, And he came out and went as he was wont, or want, 
W-O-N-T. That means that was his uh, habit. He had a tradition of doing this. This was something he had been known to do before. And he was doing it again. Why? Because he wanted to. As he was wanting. So the Mount of Olives and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. He was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed. So this is one of the past less traveled. Jesus himself had to pray. Jesus had to pray. This was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And this was the night of his arrest, his betrayal by Judas Iscariot. But this wasn't the only time in his life that he prayed. The Bible tells us, I believe in the book of Matthew as well as the book of Luke, that he prayed all night. He went up into a mountain, he prayed all night. And after that all night prayer meeting, that's when he called the 12 disciples that he later called apostles. And then they were part of the foundation of the early church, the church fathers. Other times, Jesus did miracles, and all the people came out to try to elevate him. They wanted to make him some kind of political figure. And he walked out, walked out, he went out into the wilderness, and he prayed. So time and time again, the Bible tells us that Jesus prayed. Mm -hmm. and, and by prayer is, is the only way that we can establish and to maintain any kind of spirituality right if all we do is go to church for an hour we don't really have the spirituality that god wants us to have my prayer is that spiritual connection up to god where we focus our heart and our mind upon god and we reach out to him, and God responds to that desire, right? That uh, He said there in uh, the book of Psalms, Psalms 42, I believe, where he said, As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. That desire, I'll re preach it, somebody else is going to preach it. But it's in the Bible. I'll play drives all day. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. There's nothing new under the sun. Okay, here we go. But that desire for that water of God, that desire for God's presence, he said that he inhabits the praises of Israel, the praises of his people. That when we praise God, when we reach out to him with a positive mind, a positive mental attitude, we're believing in him, we're trusting in him, we're crying out to him like a child crying to his parents. A child cries to their parents, will we turn a deaf ear? Your baby's crying in the other room or your grandbaby's crying. You're just going to let them cry? They're calling your name. They're saying they need your help. They need assistance. Something is going on. Are you just going to let it go? You're just going to roll over, take a nap? Put on earplugs? Put on headphones, turn on something? Some, something to block the other sound? No. And neither does God do that. Right? The Bible says, The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. Right? But we have to pray and mean business. We have to pray with our heart. We have to reach out to him with a need and with a desire for him to touch us. Because if we don't pray, then we begin to stray. If we don't pray correctly, then that, that influence of God, that spirituality in us can begin to die down. It's like that sanctuary fire, that altar fire that God said, keep the fire burning in the altar. Let that light inside the tabernacle always be burning. He said, it shall never go out. But to keep any fire burning, you got to put more fuel in there. You have to continue to add wood or oil or whatever it is to let that fire burn. And every time we pray, we're adding more fuel to that fire of love and devotion unto Almighty God. Where that fire continues to burn in a life that has been dedicated. Amen. 
that is pleasing unto God. He said a broken spirit, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. O oh God, thou wilt not despise. That contrite heart that's broken, that contrite, contrite heart that's sorrowful for the, the last time we messed up and we failed God in some way and, and we pray to make restitution, we pray to become reconciled one more time. The, the Bible says, Psalm 23, He restoreth my soul. If our soul did not need restoration, then he wouldn't have said that. But just living our life, just being in this world, just having sinner influences around, it, it, can, it begins to trouble our, our heart and our spirit to where we reach out to God and we say, God, renew me again. God, help me to have the right attitude again. God, help me, Lord, to be restored in your love. Good. But not everybody path of less travel, but it's the good path. Amen. Not everybody may be doing it, but that doesn't mean it's wrong to do it. Good. And I was thinking about, you know, the early church, how they would get together. We do what we do, and there's a reason why we do what we do, you know, in, in church, and, and how the order of service, and, and things, you know, it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. But I thought about that early church, how sometimes they probably just got together and just prayed. You know, because the, the, the goal of preaching is to, uh, is for God to touch the heart of the listener to get us to that place where we want to pray and reach out to God. And sometimes we have what they call a hallelujah breakdown. That's where everybody in there is already hungry and thirsty for God. They're already ready to pray. And the preacher may only say a couple words. And everybody there just goes straight into it. Everybody that wants to. I guess I can't speak for everybody. Everybody that wants to just goes into that spirit of worship. And they're praising God. And they're worshiping God. And, and they're down the, at the altars. And they're helping other people to pray through. And, and, and different things. But, but, you know, to have that as more of a focus than to preach, because the more we preach, the less we're praying, right? And we have an altar call at the end most of the time. But sometimes people just, they'll bow down on their knees and, and they'll put their head in the pew or in the seat, but their heart isn't really connecting with God. And in their mind, they're thinking about, the, the next 10 minutes after they leave, uh, there are other, other stuff they have to do later today or tomorrow, later this week. They're thinking about different things, different people, instead of praying for their own soul. And, and that's where it's at. And, and, and we've had altar calls where we try to pray with people and say, what do you want to pray about? And they're like, well, I want to pray for my mom. I want to pray for my cousin. I want to pray for this one or that one. And, uh, and But the whole point of being in church and having that altar call is so that that person that's there can pray for themselves. So that God can touch them and that God can change them. Not to pray for everybody else and their neighbor out there. Nothing wrong with praying for your neighbor. There's nothing wrong with praying for your mom. <laughs> but, but the ultimate... Uh, the ultimate issue is we have to pray for ourselves. We have to be something before we can do something. Mm -hmm. We have to get right with God before God can hear our prayer for anybody else out there. You know, the, the emphasis is on the individual, right? When we, re when we reach out to God and God touches us and God changes us, now we're ready to pray for other people. He said there in Psalm 51, the psalm of repentance, one of the psalms of repentance, King David, he said, Create in me a clean heart, renew in me a right spirit. He said, Then I will teach transgressors your law. Then I will show others the right way. See, that's the structure of it. We get right with God first, and then we get involved trying to work on helping other people. But if we're focused on other people, 
We're, we're missing out. The only one person we can truly influence for God is ourself. All right, next path, the path of faith and obedience. So well, that's two things. What can I say? Matthew chapter 7, verses 12 through 15. Jesus speaking, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. This is also called what the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But how, how seldom is it practiced? Right? You, think, you think about somebody says something to you or they do something to you. And, and we're always reacting like, man, that wasn't very right. That wasn't very nice. Man, they're, they're coming at me kind of kind of sideways here. They're, they're not being very loving and caring towards me. And, and we're always feeling like we're being victimized or something. But to, to do unto others, right? What if we were... You know, uh, there's, uh, I, I don't want to get too, too far off track, but some people are, are kind of uh, quiet. And they'll, they'll go into a room where they work, whatever, and they just look around. They won't say anything. And, and some of us, you know, gravity's been working on us for a long time. I, I feel like I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a figure inside a wax museum. And they got the heat up too high. You know, this, this, this is just, everything just kind of, you know, gravity just drooping everything down. You know, looking like a bulldog or something. Um, and, and, and so if you don't say anything, and, and you walk into a room and there's other people there, then they can think that you're unfriendly because you didn't, you didn't show yourself to be friendly. You didn't say anything nice to them. You didn't say good morning. You didn't say how are you. And, and, but in, in your own heart, you're like, well, there's nothing wrong with me. You didn't say good morning to them. Well, they didn't say good morning to me either. If that's, if that's how we're going to play it, then uh, nobody has to do anything, right? If we're only doing what somebody else does to us, or we're only reciprocating what we receive back, then where's the obligation? Where's, where's that obedience? Okay. He said here, enter, enter ye in at the straight gate. This is all in the same passage here, right here together. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. In, in the world, people look at a majority, and they say the majority rules. So whatever the larger group of people in any given demographic are saying is, this is the right way, this is the way we should do things, then they feel like they have some kind of moral, um, they call it a mandate. It's not two guys going to a movie. It's not a mandate. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I know. That's terrible. <laughs> okay. But a, <laughs> but a mandate means something that has authority behind it. The weight of authority that this is the right way to do things. And, and people say, well, look at everybody else. They're rioting. They're breaking all the windows. They're stealing all the stereos and DVD players and, and smartphones or whatever. So I'm doing it too. It must be the right thing. No. It's not. The majority is always wrong when it comes to the things of God. And that narrow way, it, it's really walking in the steps of Jesus. And we'll get into that uh, a little bit later on, God willing. But there, there's not room for our own ideas and our own opinions and a bunch of uh, denominational church dogma. You know, a lot of people, they want to light candles and, and uh, you know, they, they have all these different customs that they follow. But if it's not biblical, then it's not a good foundation. It's not a good basis to, to operate. The Bible gives us more than enough to follow without going with some other ideas and some other uh, teachings that is not based in God's word. That straight path where 
Um, I don't know if you've ever been pulled over doing a sobriety check. I'll, I'll change the names to <laughs> protect the innocent. <laughs> but one, one of the things they want you to do is to walk a straight line. Right. And, and, if, and if, if you get up on the paint on the, you know, there's like painted line on the side of the road. You get up on that painted line, and I no, 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 stand over on this side. They want you to walk a straight line with no, no guide. You know, and, and uh, maybe your balance isn't that great, or, or maybe you're not that coordinated or whatever. But they want to check your sobriety to see, they call it a field sobriety check, see if you're uh, really fit to be operating that motor vehicle. And if you're inebriated, chances are you're not going to be able to walk that straight line. And to walk this straight path, and I know this isn't talking about straight, right? This is talking about straight, like narrow, right? But still, right? To, to walk that straight line after Jesus, to follow the example of Jesus Christ. That's why we, we call this the path, the path of faith and obedience, because... Uh, if, we, if we don't believe it enough to incorporate into our life to obey it, then it really doesn't mean anything to us. And we, we can know this Bible inside and out. You can know it backwards and forwards. But until we believe it enough to change our life, to line up with it, until we get the Word of God inside our heart, He said, Thy Word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. When it's in your heart, it becomes a part of you. When it's in your heart, you don't do it because somebody's watching or because you might get in trouble for it. You do it because it's in your heart. It's part of your character now. It's part of who we are. We're doing it because this is what God has made us to become as Christians. Straight as the gate narrows the way to lead into life, you'll be the find it. Beware of false prophets. See, all in the same chapter, that same section. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ravening. It's just interesting to me in that same passage. He's talking about the golden rule, the wide, wide way, the narrow way, and then also false prophets. That appear one way but on the inside there's something else and for me that's that's kind of why well, I don't I don't get into a lot of other church uh, ministry you know to, to see what somebody else has to say or you know did, did you see what this mega church pastor was teaching or what um, I don't know those guys I don't know them the Bible says to know them which labor among you Right? The Apostle Paul went traveling all around. He wrote these letters, we call them epistles, and all these, uh, all these different places where he had been, Ephesus, uh, Galatia, which is not a city, it was a whole region, uh, Philippi, um, Colossae, different places where he had traveled. And he, he told each of those places that he set up the, these elders. Before he left, he left someone there in charge to watch, watch over that congregation. But they didn't, he didn't have, you know, all these other random people coming from different places telling that congregation, this is what you, you should do. In fact, when other people came in from other places, many times they were saying something that wasn't correct. Churches that the Apostle Paul had started, and then it, it led to this big dispute because some of them were saying, you have, you have to still follow the law of Moses. You have to be circumcised. You have to follow these dietary restrictions. And the Apostle Paul said, that's not right. That's not true. And they said, okay, let's go, let's go talk to the church elders in Jerusalem. And we'll set this matter straight. And when they got there, they had apostles that were in charge of the whole church operation back in the day. And it was James, the half-brother of Jesus, stood up and he said, this is how it's going to be. Right? He said, if they're Gentile brothers, they shall abstain from fornication. They will not eat things strangled, and they will not eat blood. 
And he, he said, that's, that's the extent of the law that they are responsible for. And they resolved it. But whenever you just you take somebody's word for it, you don't know who they are. You don't know what their life is, right? You can come to my house, you can see how I live. My pastor and other, other ministers in our church, I've been to their houses. I've sat at their table. I've traveled with them, some of you know, driving from short distances or whatever. I see how they roll, I know their life. I know, I know they have the goods. So I'm on board with that. But some stranger, I don't know. Jesus told, uh, he spoke there in John chapter 10. He said, the voice of a stranger, my sheep will not follow. I don't care what they have to say. If they're a stranger to me, then I, I can't really trust them. Why? Because Jesus said, if the blind follow the blind, they both shall fall into the ditch. It matters who we trust. Amen. It matters who we open ourselves up to. It matters where the direction we're going. It all matters. And so, well, this one, they have this idea, they have that idea. Well, what does the Bible say? Amen. Let, let's, let's, let's look at the good book. Let's not go with uh, the, the, the vote of popular opinion. Right? Faith and obedience also, path of faithfulness unto, unto Jesus. John chapter 6. There's so much, I mean, I won't have time to finish everything, so we might put some of this in on Wednesday night. But anyway. John chapter 6, verse 60. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured, and he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are alive. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore, Said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it, except it were given unto him of my Father. From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? He was preaching them right things. He was preaching them how, how to please God, how, how to get right with God. And he, he was telling them, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they were thinking, we need lunch, we want to have lunch. And he said, no, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And he said, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And this is where he was telling them, the words that I speak are spirit and they are life. The things of God are spiritually discerned. The carnal mind cannot receive them. They couldn't understand what he was saying because he was speaking to them in spiritual truth and they couldn't, uh, they couldn't receive it because they were carnal in their thinking and in their minds. But the truth is we have to have the body of Christ, the essence of Christ, the blood of Christ to cleanse us from all of our sin. We need to have the body of Christ, the essence of who and what he is inside of us. If we're ever going to walk inside the gates of heaven, we've had to have the one that built heaven living inside of us. There's no other way we're going to make it, friends. We have to be true to him that has called us. We can't just take uh, pick and choose what we want from the Bible. We have to be what God wants us to be. We have to be true servants of His. We have to be true worshipers of Him. We have to really have the goods. We can't be pretending and put on a certain show in front of other people when God sees how we are in our hearts. He wants us to be real. So well. Uh, that's a tall order, isn't it? As long as we stay close to Jesus. Yeah. He makes all the difference. 
The disciples means disciplined followers of Christ. They weren't off on their own. So where, where are you going, Jesus? You going over there? Okay, we're going to be going way over here. We're going to be off here doing our own thing because we got a better idea. Yeah, no. The disciples were with Jesus. They were in the boat together. They traveled together. They were having dinner together. The last supper together. Everywhere together. So the problem is if we're not together with Jesus, then where are we? We're off on our own. The book of Amos chapter 3 said, can two walk together except they be agreed? And if you want to go to God's heaven, you want to have your place with Jesus, you got to go with Jesus all the way. We can't be a fair weather friend. I say, as long as, as, long as it doesn't conflict with what I want to do, as long as, I, as long as I have to go too overboard or too extreme, then, you know, then that's fine. path of humility and subjection. I know. Where'd you, where'd you come up with this? This is crazy talk. <laughs> humility? Dude, don't you know who, you, who I am? Don't you know who you're talking to? All right, well, Paul, was it? With, uh, with all due respect, right? with all due respect, let me just share with you. This, uh, this Hebrews chapter 13 Beginning of verse 7, he said, Remember them which have the rule over you. So what? Somebody got the rule over me? I'm not subject to any man. I do what I want to do. Nobody tells me what to do. Okay, well, the path of humility and subjection. All right. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Consider the end of their manner of life, looking at these men and women of God who have laid it all down, and they serve God faithfully for years and years, and then God promoted them, and they've gone home to their reward. Consider that. That's the example to follow. Amen. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar, where if they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. You know, sometimes people feel left out. I think you found, you found out from a friend of a friend, that all these other friends went and did something fun without you, like Disneyland. <laughs> to Disneyland and that nobody said anything to you. You feel left out. You feel hurt. You feel abandoned. Rejected. Well, here he's saying, we have an altar. He said, those folks over there in Jerusalem, they, they were pushing out the, the early church, the, the church members, many of them had been Jewish uh, disciples. They had followed all the teachings of Moses. But when word got around that they believed in Jesus uh, as, their, as their Savior, as their Messiah, that they were ostracized and set apart. The Jewish people in Jerusalem, they would not patronize the Christian Jewish businesses. So they had to take up a, a collection. Thank you for your giving to they had to take up a collection for these poor disciples in Jerusalem that weren't able to make ends meet. And that was part of the persecution that was going on. But he said here, we have an altar. They don't want to let us into the temple. They don't want to let us participate in, in, in their observances of the law. He said, that's okay. We have an altar. We got our own altar. That they don't have a part to this one. This is an altar that is in heaven. This is an altar that the blood of Jesus was sprinkled out there before God the Father to satisfy, to appease the wrath of God against sin so that now we can appear before the presence of God holy and blameless, without spot, without wrinkle. We have an altar. 
where they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts which, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp bearing the reproach. Talking about humility and subjection. Saying Jesus was rejected. And if we are to identify with Christ fully, then we will feel that same type of rejection. Not everybody is glad that you've been born again. Not everybody will be happy that you believe the Holy Scriptures. Not everyone will be happy that you spend that time in prayer. Not everybody will be happy that you're going to church because it brings condemnation and conviction to them. They're reminded every time they see a Christian doing right that they're not right. And rather than them own up to their own sorriness and their own sin and to repent and make it right, they'd rather attack and tear down the Christian. So, well, you don't have to go to church all the time. Well, you don't have to be fanatical about it. Well, I know the Bible says that, but... Ain't no buts. Ain't no buts about it, right? No ifs, no ifs, ands, or buts. That's right. This, <laughs> this <sounds silly. laughs> but it either means what it says or it doesn't. And if it doesn't mean what it says, then God isn't true. But we believe and we know that God is true. Amen. And it does mean what it says. And if we're not in, in line with what God wants for us, it's our responsibility to make things right. It's our responsibility to pray and to repent and to change. Verse 14, for here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Sacrifice of praise. And not, not everybody made it for the whole song service, but to worship God with song, man, that'll get under somebody's skin. If you're over there praising God and worshiping God and singing like an opera singer, <laughs> you know, so uh, this, uh, was it? Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus. For the Bible tells me so. Or whatever good praise and worship song you've got in your heart, and you just let it out, you know, without fear, without shame. A lot of people won't sing if there's anybody else around because they're afraid of being criticized. And the same people that are afraid of being criticized are the same people that don't want you to sing out either. <laughs> because I because I don't feel comfortable singing out. I don't want you singing out around me either. And don't ride in the car with me. <laughs> you will be hating me. I promise you, I'll hate you. But that sacrifice of praise, it cost you something to, to let that praise and worship bubble up from your heart and come out your mouth and reach up to God in heaven. But that's one of the holiest things that you can do as a Christian. It is one of the most worthy things, acceptable things that you can do in worship to God. And I'm not saying make a fool of yourself in public or anything, but if it's your house, it's your house. If it's your car, it's your car. Yeah. Amen. And, and so you don't have to be ashamed to worship your God. He said, but to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourself. Now, why is that in the Bible? Why is that in the Bible? Who wants to do that? And talking about the path less traveled, how many people do you encounter in your day-to-day -day life that when you talk to them, they say, oh, you know what, I'm not sure about that. I need to check with my pastor. That's what I'm talking about. How many people do you know? Have you ever known? 
that have ever said anything like that, let me check with my church elders. Let me check with the man of God. Let me, let me see what the pastor's wife has to say or something like that. How many people do you know? Let me get a stand up. Because they're not humble. They're not submitted unto the Lordship of Christ because it's all, it's not a pyramid scheme, but there is a hierarchy in God where Jesus has given gifts unto men, some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. These, this is things that Jesus started. He left the disciples to care for that early church, and, and they had authority. If you read Acts chapter 5, you'll see what I'm talking about. They had authority. Submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they them must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that is unprofitable for you. And as we're closing here, as we're closing, the word Christian means Christ-like or an imitator of Christ. And my first pastor used to always say this in, in church. He'd always say, aren't you glad you're a Christian? Like, yes, sir. He said, don't you wish everybody was a Christian? I'm like, amen. And he said, just like you. Huh? Just like me? I hope that changes it a little. Because then, then it's saying, are, are, we, are we really the Christian that God wants us to be? Amen. Amen. Are we really like Jesus? Or another minister would say, if, if we were on trial, being charged with being a Christian, could enough evidence be gathered from watching our lives to convict us of the charge of being a Christian? And Isaiah 52, and you can give the pastor the music. Isaiah 52, verse 14. As many were astonished or astonished at the, his visage, his appearance was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. I'm talking about Jesus. Isaiah 53. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Talking about Jesus. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken, and he made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. 
He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many. And made intercession for the transgressors. And there in verse 1 of that same chapter, he said, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Will you believe today? Will you let the Jesus Christ of Christmas, that baby born in Bethlehem to the Virgin Mary, will you allow him to grow up to be your Savior? Will you allow the one that took all the shame to be your Lord and your God? The path less traveled. It may be not that popular, but it's the only path that leads us where we want to go. Let's find a place to pray just for a while. God bless you.
just so good. And uh, we're so thankful for everything that God does. The Bible says the goodness of God leads us to repentance. So it doesn't mean we're always perfect. doesn't mean we're always having our best day in our Christian life. But uh, there's something else I wanted to share, but it's already been past the time. But when we're adopted through Jesus, we become part of God's family. And just like a husband and a wife, once you cross that line, you're married. We may not be everything we're supposed to be every day in that, in that uh, marriage relationship. Our kids may not always behave the way we want them to and the way we teach them to. But that doesn't mean that that relationship family is severed just because we're not doing 100% what we're supposed to be. And so it is as God's children. We may come short of the glory of God sometimes. We may uh, not, not be hitting all of um, the, the, the things that God wants us to be and, and how to behave and what to say and things like that. But as long as we go back to God and we confess our sins Amen. And, and God is not going to throw us away. God loves you with an undying love. The love of God passes all knowledge, but our faithfulness and obedience to him, that's our love to God. So if, if we're coming up short, again, the, the biggest problem is going to be a lack of prayer time, real prayer time, not just saying words, but to really mean business where you're, you commit to God in that time of prayer emotionally when the tears begin to flow and your heart begins to break then you're praying I'm not saying anything else is not real praying but I'm saying that's that's where it's at the breaking of our heart that contrite heart that desire to be right with God to please God to be restored for God to change us to renew us again that's where it's at be part of God's family and still not be perfect sons and daughters Amen. but God is a perfect father Amen. and he will love us he will help us as long as we keep going back to him um, so please uh, be uh, here to support Jonas and Marissa next Sunday uh, after the Sunday service they're going to get married is that right? Amen. after you have the marriage license <laughs> uh, it's going to be awesome all right. And then fellowship meeting coming up uh, Saturday, January 9th. We should have more information on it tomorrow. I'll be sending that as soon as it becomes available. But um, this is going to be very special. So I know some people work Saturdays, other, you know, whatever. Just pray about it. Do the best that you can and make yourself available for that fellowship meeting. If you don't, if you don't uh, do anything else, I ask you to do. So Reverend Hall should be preaching. Uh, he's our overseer um, in Arizona, and coming all the way over. So if he can come from from uh, Phoenix, uh, Glendale area to Bakersfield, I think we could go 100 miles. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I I think we could do it, and uh, but it's going to be a very special time. Amen. I promise you, and you won't regret being there. It's going to be a blessing. Uh, this time we'll dismiss.